Okay, welcome everybody to the June Canada Wildfire webinar. We're really lucky today to have Matt McDonald from BC Wildfire Services Predictive Services Unit here to talk to us today. He's going to talk to us about seasonal outlooks and a bit about communicating those um, to different groups. So I'm coming to you from Treaty 6 territory today. Um, I'm located in what is now called the Duke, Alberta, and I would like us all to just take a moment and think about the places where we work and play and live. Um, today we're going to be having Matt talk to us, and I'm going to ask everyone to please post questions in the chat if they come up during the discussion. We're going to do it a little bit differently today, so the main presentation will be recorded. However, once Matt's done, we're going to turn off the recording so we can have an open dialogue Q&A where people hopefully feel comfortable turning on their camera, turning on their microphone. So um, feel free to post questions in the chat or hold them until the end if you would like to ask live. So with that, I'm going to hand over the reins here to Matt. Thank you, Matt, so much for joining us today. All right, thank you, Karen, and good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, depending on where you're joining from. Uh, before I get started, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge that I'm very fortunate to be uh, living working and playing in the uh, traditional and unceded territory of the Tanaha, the Sayelks, and the Sinaixt First Nations people, which is uh, in and around the Nelson area of uh, southeastern British Columbia. So yeah, thanks for the opportunity to uh, present today. Uh, I will say that it's been a very busy start to the fire season here in, in Western Canada, uh, similar to Eastern Canada. Um, so yeah, quite the start here. A uh, very timely presentation today. Uh, we actually just issued our, our summer outlook yesterday via a live stream to uh, the ministers. And uh, you can find that on YouTube if you're interested. I'll be covering a lot of the content actually in today's uh, presentation. Um, that being said, how busy it's been. Uh, I didn't have as much time to put into this talk as I would have liked, but uh, we'll give it a whirl here. Um, so just... Uh, Oh, there we are. Where we're going, uh, you know, I think it's important to uh, to talk a lot about the caveats about a, a seasonal forecast. Um, a little bit about my background. I was I'm uh, I've been with the BC Wildfire Service for three years now as the uh, the lead fire weather forecaster. I've got a team of uh, four internal forecasters, and then we rely on another uh, ten to twelve contractors to help. Uh, give us the odd break during the summer and also fill uh, the two other fire center forecast desks. We have six fire centers in British Columbia, plus the Provincial Wildfire Coordination Center, which I just finished briefing a couple minutes ago. And um, yeah, we, we pretty much go daily once the fire hazard is up and running. So we've been uh, providing seven day a week briefings and spot forecasts and text forecasts and alerts and all that good stuff uh, daily here uh, since uh, since late May. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to talk about the limitations of seasonal forecasts. Uh, I've been doing them for, for a couple decades now. I was with Environment Canada for uh, 18 years and got to present those quite a bit. Um, I'm going to touch on the importance of antecedent conditions. I think uh, a lot of people get drawn in thinking that we're going to tell them how August is going to play out and uh, the science is just not there and uh, we'll likely never get there. And so we like to focus our attention on where we've been, you know, taking a look at the past is really helpful when we're trying to predict the future. Uh, so we, we, we spend a lot of time setting the stage and I'll speak to some of the products we use to do that. And then uh, we found it really helpful to kind of paint possible scenarios. Uh, once we know where we currently sit with elevated drought conditions in particular pockets of the province or some areas are perhaps greener than others, you know, we then present scenarios and how this might play out and then what the associated, um, you know, impacts and consequences might be. And then at the end of the, the presentation, we'll open it up to questions and I'm hoping to hear from you. So, you know, when we're talking about a seasonal forecast, uh, so in the world of meteorology, we define season in fixed three month uh, periods. So the summer season is always defined as June, July, August, uh, because as you know, you know, equinoxes and solstices move around every year and it'd just be way too much too complicated to like move these, these dates around. So meteorological seasons always start on the first of, in this case, June, and then go through June, July, and August. So that's what we define as uh, as the summer, the meteorological summer. Um, 
And when we're talking about weather over a three month period, um, you know, I like to say the devil's in the details. And if you make enough averages of averages, uh, one of my favorite quotes is uh, you end up with information that's completely void of anything useful. And so here's a perfect example. Uh, I just made up this graph. Uh, it's from Cape Average Weather Station. And uh, it's just a fictitious example of, you know, you could have a record breaking uh, warm January, right? So 20 degrees above normal through, uh, you know, January 7th to 9th, uh, hypothetically speaking. And then just, just so happens that all that warmth coincides with the calendar dates. And so maybe January comes out and is a, a record breaking warm month, right? Maybe it's in a monster El Nino or it's, you know, it's just incredibly warm. There's no snow. Everyone's freaking out. And then if you get lucky or unlucky, depending on how you look at it, and your month of February just also lines up with a prolonged Arctic cold snap, you know, that could have also have been a record breaking month uh, from a cold perspective. So you've got this really warm January, you've got this really cold February, and then maybe March is kind of like closer to average. And when you average out all these numbers, over the season, over a three month period. Um, so there's all the records, you know, media is getting all excited. Oh, it's record breaking heat in January and then record breaking cold snaps in February. And then really the the end of winter is, is kind of blah. You look back at all these average numbers, you know, 90 days worth of average temperatures and your winter will have looked, oh, it was just a little bit warmer than average. And so therein lies the challenge when you're talking about weather over a three month period and this one for example you would say oh the winter of 2022-23 was uh was just slightly warmer than average but it's like well hold on we had this record-breaking warmth in january and we had record-breaking cold snap in february but in the long range it all averages out so you guys are probably getting the point here um, you really have to be careful and cautious when you're talking about seasonal forecasts and um, yeah, the devil's in the details. And the same argument can be made uh, from the precipitation perspective. And here's a great example from this spring uh, up in Fort St. John, where some of our biggest fires are burning right now. Uh, you know, when you look at precipitation amounts through the spring in Fort St. John, they recorded 100 millimeters of rain. And if we compare that to hist historical averages for that same period, they usually pick up 93 millimeters of rain. So you're thinking, oh, they got uh, just slightly more than average precipitation. But again, the devil's in the details. If you actually look at how this rain played out, it was super dry, March, April, and May. And then we had a two day weather event, um, this you know southeasterly feed into the Northern Rockies, and they picked up 60 millimeters of rain in one day. And for those of you who have been in the world of fire for a long time, you will appreciate that it's much better to get consistent small amounts, you know, two to three millimeters per day, each and every day for 90 days, as opposed to getting 60 millimeters of rain in just one single day. Um, you know, soils and forests and fuels become what we call hydrophobic. And the soils actually lose their their, their capacity to absorb moisture, particularly when it's been dry for, for such a long time. And, and that's the case this spring and, and summer in the peace country. They've just seen drought that's lasted, you know, more than, than a year, uh, stemming back from last fall. And so by throwing 60 millimeters of rain uh, on the ground and at these fires, uh, fires slowed down for two days. And three days later, they were just right back up and marching along with rank five fire behavior. So again, the devil's in the details. You could look from a kind of the 30,000 foot view and think, oh, um, Fort St. John, the peace country sitting good. They got a whole bunch of rain in that two day period, but it's it's not actually true when you look at uh, at how it plays out. So, you know, I've just spoken about season's worth of temperature and season's worth of precipitation kind of in hindsight. But if you flip that over to a future forecast, the same arguments could be applied. Just because we're saying, oh, it's gonna be a warmer than normal summer, people all of a sudden start picturing flip-flops and margaritas and patio weather. 
but it doesn't mean that we won't get a couple cold snaps in there, right? We could have freakishly cold weather at the end of July for some reason or the second week of August. But come September, when we look back on the previous three months, the summer most likely will have been quote unquote warmer than normal. And we rarely specify how much more warmer than normal. Is it going to be half a degree? Is it going to be a full degree Celsius warmer than normal over that 90 day period? Um, yeah. So just keep that in mind when we're talking about seasonal forecasts, we're talking about three months worth of weather. And uh, I quite like this quote. I'll give you a second here to read it. And so I think this is super applicable uh, to the world of meteorology, to weather forecasting, and to predicting, you know, fire seasons. Um, on average, you know, we like the, the the public as a whole and emergency managers and decision makers are, are often looking for a binary answer. They're, you know, they want to hear, okay, it's going to be a record-breaking hot summer. It's going to be, uh, you know, a rainy summer. They want to know the third week of August when their daughter's wedding is scheduled, what the weather's going to be on that day. And there's simply no way of, of saying that. And I think the way in which we approach seasonal forecasts needs to be adjusted. We need to be thinking in a probabilistic type fashion as opposed to a binary-like uh, fashion. You know, we need to get into likelihoods and probabilities of certain situations playing out and and avoiding that that binary it's going to be hot and dry or it's going to be cold and wet because that's going to probably set you up for for failure and the media loves seasonal forecasts you know uh there's been some really hilarious uh press coming out of of seasonal forecasts uh, i'll show you a few here so you know, a few winters back, we had the Godzilla El Nino, right? This record-breaking, strong El Nino that was deep, persistent. Uh, the sea surface temperature anomalies off the <clears throat> coast of Peru were anomalously warm. And so some, some person nicknamed it the Godzilla El Nino, and this just took off uh, like wild, wildfire. Um, then we had the attack of La Nina, right? um and and the list goes on and on right and and you know there's various weather enterprises we'll call them that are more in the world of uh what i call weather attainment so they they put out these glowing reviews i mean we've all heard of the farmer's almanac um i won't name names but you know there's various weather prediction companies and you know media outlets that that really like to gain uh viewership and attention by by putting out these these you know glowing dramatic uh seasonal forecast so you know AccuWeather said it's going to be our coldest winter in 50 years and the weather network said we're in for a wicked summer and tornadoes and you know again keeping in mind that we're talking about weather over a three-month period and and really that there's there's limited skill and i'm going to spend quite a bit of time talking about the skill of, uh, of seasonal forecasts um and there's no way i remember you know Two years ago when we when we all lived through the heat dome in western canada i mean we we absolutely shattered records uh right across uh british columbia uh it was the hottest national temperature record ever recorded in in, in canada right Lytton for three days in a row uh broke the national heat record it was 48 and then it was 49 and then the third day it was 49.6 and we all remember uh, what happened to Lytton uh, thereafter but heading into that season, all we were saying was it's likely it's going to be a warmer than normal summer, right? But there's no way we could have forecasted this heat dome and the intensity and the persistence of it anything more than two weeks in advance. Um, fortunately, the models in this case were, were rather consistent, um, the ensemble models heading into the heat dome. So we were already issuing messaging to our advanced planners, you know, our crews, our firefighters, emergency managers. We're all kind of expecting this heat wave to unfold but not quite to the intensity which it did and so when we're talking again about seasonal forecasts it's really difficult to pick out extreme events like this um, from from developing and again ultimately you know people come to the table looking for the potential 
for impacts for you know disastrous events to unfold and i think about the atmospheric rivers that we experienced in november 2020 here on the bc coast you know the heat dome and again there's no way of of forecasting that type of event anything beyond kind of the two week period there's just too much chaos and uncertainty in the atmosphere and it's such a dynamic viscous fluid the atmosphere and yeah, I'm sure you can all appreciate, you know, getting the day three and four forecast right is hard enough. So forecasting anything beyond a week or two at most is uh, is impossible. And one question you should ask yourselves, as I presume most of you are scientists, is, you know, how do all these seasonal forecasts verify? And it's one thing, you know, I'd like to say anyone can throw out a seasonal forecast, right? You think about the farmer's almanac that goes to print 18 months in advance. So they're they're issuing a, you know, a fall forecast 18 months in advance. That's pretty impressive. You know, I don't know if they're listening to their grasshoppers scratch their legs and the fuzzy caterpillars and, you know, the bunnies have been really active this spring. So we're in for a cold winter. Um, but do they actually verify their forecasts? Right, and and more importantly, what is that seasonal forecast built on? Uh, believe it or not, the Farmer's Almanac uh, claim that their seasonal forecast uh, resolve, revolves around uh, solar sunspot activity, and there's been proof that there's zero correlation with solar flares and and our weather. Um, and furthermore, that their secret recipe resides in a black box in Connecticut. So. That speaks to the science behind their seasonal forecast, but really any reputable weather agency that's putting out a seasonal forecast will then go through the exercise of verifying that seasonal forecast. So how did it actually play out? Um, here in Canada, we're super fortunate. Uh, Environment Canada is among the top five leading international weather agencies. They produce what's called the CANSIPS uh, seasonal forecast, which is the Canadian seasonal um, prediction system. And again, after each season, after each month, they go and verify and see, okay, well, how did that seasonal forecast play out? Was it too hot? Was it too cold? Was it too wet? Was it too dry? Where throughout the country did it verify best? Where did it verify least? And so you can look at all these statistics, something that very few people will actually bother go doing, but there's a great learning opportunity there. And the skill of the seasonal forecast has a, quite a bit of variability from season to season. There's periods in the year particularly the summer where seasonal forecasts do quite well, particularly in terms of temperature. And there's other parts of the year when they struggle, uh, spring being one of those, just because of the convective nature of our weather patterns pretty much across the country. Um, so it's one thing to put out a forecast. So for here, we've got last summer's forecast. So this was issued May 31st, 2022. And we were looking at the temperature anomalies across Canada. And so you can see that uh, Ontario and Quebec, Atlantic Canada, the north, they were expecting warmer than normal conditions. And then down along the international border from um, Manitoba through the prairies and into BC, they were expecting a cooler than normal summer. And then if you actually look at how it played out, um, which they do at Environment Canada, and they score their seasonal forecast, uh, you would argue that they, they did a pretty good job up in, in Nunavut and uh, even the Yukon, but they completely blew it for uh, for southern British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, right? So you can see that they were forecasting cooler than normal in the green here, when in fact it played out uh, the very opposite, right? So if you like to get egg in your face and uh, and eat crow, uh, seasonal forecasts are a great place to to enter. Uh, there's a very I've I've learned I've learned about this the hard way. Um, you know, if you come out with uh, glowing sound bites for the media to eat up and uh, and distribute, you're, you're probably gonna get burnt. Uh, you need to communicate this in a very probabilistic fashion. And then you you get into the whole realm of, uh, you know, communicating uncertainty, which is a bit of an art and a science in and of itself. So yeah, it can be, it can be quite tricky. And then long range precipitation forecasts. I will straight up say there is no skill and long range precipitation forecasts. Uh, and that's for various reasons. Uh, it's one thing to peg the temperature anomalies over a three month period, but if you're trying to talk about rainfall and or snowfall over a three month period, you're, you're just setting yourself up for failure. And here's an example again from last summer, uh, you know, they are forecasting wetter than normal conditions across British Columbia where I am 
and uh, the very opposite unfolded. And quite honestly, I don't even waste time looking at these um, long range forecasts for, for precipitation, because again, there's no skill. You'd be better off flipping a coin, to be honest, and I'll, I'll get to the skill in, in a bit here. So I like to, in the words of public enemy, don't believe the hype. Um, so when we're looking at temperature forecasts, and I, I put a lot more faith into these, and again, this is the one that was issued for, for last summer, and it was showing a uh, likelihood of, of colder than normal. And so let's just take a minute here to define what these charts are actually showing. A lot of people look at these charts and they see red over Nova Scotia, and they're like, oh my God, it's going to be a cooker of a summer. Well, no, hold on. We're talking about the possibility of three different scenarios playing out, okay? So when you see yellows, orange, and reds, that's high likelihood of warmer than normal conditions playing out over that three month period. So June, July, and August, right? So all that means is that come September, looking back in the rear view mirror, it could have been 0 0.01 degrees above normal for that three month period, and they would have nailed the forecast. And yet most Nova Scotians might be thinking, well, it wasn't a very nice summer. It was, you know, it seemed pretty average. Well, it was just barely warmer than normal. And you would say they nailed it. Uh, in blue is high likelihoods of colder than normal uh, conditions. And then the hues of kind of magenta purple are near normal. And then what often gets misinterpreted is areas in white. People see white and they're like, oh, it's gonna be a near normal summer for us. And that's not at all it. Areas in white is where the model's struggling to pick out a scenario, be it cooler than normal, near normal, or warmer than normal, okay? And that's really important to keep in mind. So we're talking the probability, again, of these three different scenarios uh, playing out. And ultimately you could argue it's like a three-sided coin or this, uh, you know, this device here that you could just spin around and pick a side, right? But really what goes into these seasonal forecasts um, is, is a lot. Uh, the folks at Environment Canada, and they've got a, an amazing team of, of research and, and climate modelers. One of the main ingredients that plays into these forecasts is uh, sea surface temperatures and sea surface temperature anomalies. So how do the current ocean uh, sit compared to historical averages? Uh, they look at the equatorial Pacific where El Nino and uh, La Nina play out. They look at the Northern Pacific, the uh, Pacific Decadal Oscillation, the Atlantic Oscillation. So they're, they're keeping a close eye on how the ocean's behaving around the world because inevitably the ocean is such a massive heat source or heat sink and uh, will warm our air masses from below. And from the simple fact that a lot of our weather comes in from the West, uh, that Pacific Ocean is very important for us here in British Columbia. Um, other factors they take into account is uh, sea ice extent, so both in uh, freshwater lakes, in the seas, you know, the Bay of Hudson, uh, the James Bay, and then up in the Arctic Ocean. So when we have healthy sea ice extent, uh, that reflects sun back into space, increased albedo, sets us up for a cooler than normal season, versus when we have a reduction in sea ice, the oceans are absorbing a lot more of that incoming long way or short wave radiation. So yeah, lots of factors at play. And I'm not an expert when it comes to uh, seasonal prediction models. Again, there's PhD people who spend their careers doing this, but uh, I'm a big uh, fan and kind of uh, user of these seasonal predictive uh, models. And yeah, they, they can be quite useful, particularly from, from the temperature perspective. And yeah, just reminding you that they, they don't always uh, work out. So uh, there's a great tool from Environment Canada. I'm going to put some links in the chat at the end of my talk. And this one's awesome. So it's CanSIPS. It's that Canadian seasonal predicting system. And it allows you to actually go and hover with your mouse over the map and you'll see the skill change, right? So in this case, it's showing you the skill score for June, July, August. So for the summer season, uh, and this is for the period of 1991 to 2020. So over the last 30 years, how have all of their summer forecasts um, performed? And you can see that, you know, you're kind of looking for the greens and the yellows, right? So when you're in the greens and the yellows, like if we look at New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, this model gets it right 50 to 60% of the time, which is better than flipping a coin. So that's encouraging. But if we look at the prairies, uh, Manitoba and Saskatchewan, for example, the skill there is 40 to 
5%, which is arguably worse than flipping a coin. So if you find yourself in that part of the country, maybe the summer forecast is not necessarily the best tool for you. We're fortunate here in BC, I think primarily because we're closer to the ocean, we feel the influence of the sea surface temperature anomalies. The skill rating tends to be relatively good, uh, kind of 55 to 60, upwards even of 65 in some re in regions like the northern tip of Vancouver Island and up near um, Prince Rupert and Terrace. So keep that in mind and I'll, I'll put a link again in the chat here where you can kind of, you know, meander around the map and uh, and look at the skill. And then when we come to the precipitation uh, forecast, and again, I can't emphasize this enough, just don't trust any long range precipitation forecast. And again, for a number of reasons, right? Particularly in the summer when we're so driven by convection, all you would need is one, you know, mesoscale convective complex or so rather large area of, of thunderstorms to park itself over, let's say you're in Sault Ste. Marie and this MCC comes over third week of July for 48 hours and delivers like 150 millimeters of rain. That will have completely blown your seasonal forecast out of the water just in that 48 hour period, right? So convection is impossible. I mean, it's challenging to forecast even today, you know, where these convective cells are going to line up over the next 24 hours. So to do it over a three month period is just, you know, you're, you're setting yourself up for failure. Uh, in the in the winter time, you'll notice the skill actually goes up for the seasonal forecast because in the winter we're dealing with much larger scale synoptic systems. And so if they happen to forecast, that the storm track through the winter is going to favor the northern half of the province. Maybe they're they're forecasting a wetter than normal winter, and that seasonal forecast will verify. You know, should that should the jet stream lock up over the northern part of the province, and and they see you know regular succession of systems. So there is some skill in the winter, but particularly in the spring and the summer, the the precipitation forecast is just uh, is just terrible to be to be quite honest and really you know the highest skill is you know up in the piece and it's still only 50 percent so kind of like flipping a coin so all that to say don't don't waste your time on on long range precipitation forecasts um <clears throat> and so for us here at the at the wildfire service in in british columbia we're you know we kind of use the uh the seasonal forecast a bit as a carrot you know, you're like, hey, come come join us. We'll tell you how the summer is going to play out. And then what we end up doing is we end up spending quite a bit of time focusing on on the past, right? So people get there and then we're talking about the last three months worth of weather and they're like, I thought we were going to get into a forecast. Uh, there's so much useful information that can be drawn out about where we've been, particularly in the world of wildfire, right? Our fuels have a long-term memory. Uh, they they hang on to drought for, for prolonged periods periods of time. And so there's a whole collection of, of tools that are available out there. On the left, uh, unfortunately, I hid this uh, badly, but uh, Agriculture and Agri-Foods Canada produce a, a great collection of maps. You can look at the last 30 days, uh, the last 90 rolling days. You can look at the last 365 days. Um, you can look at the agricultural growing season, and you can look at precipitation anomalies. You can look at total precip amounts. You can look at temperature anomalies. So check out uh, Agriculture and Agri-Foods Canada's website. Uh, really good resource there for, for monitoring how climate conditions have played out in the past. Uh, on the top right there, Environment Canada also offers up uh, similar maps. There's a fellow by the name of Mark Beauchemin in uh in quebec and he generates these great uh super useful maps i find for just keeping tabs on on the weather and how it's playing out you know sometimes we start building this this bias that like oh yeah it's been a really wet you know spring on the coast and then you actually go look and you're like oh no actually it's been close to normal whereas in this case this is uh the last 30 days here in uh in western canada and you can see you know the writing's on the wall it's been incredibly dry across vancouver island the coast right through Prince George and up into the northeast corner and the same applies to Alberta and, and Saskatchewan right so it's it it's no longer all that surprising that we're seeing fires burn with such vigor when we've uh, we've seen such big precipitation deficits and then what we do uh, and I should say that you know I'm fortunate to work with a whole team of fire behavior analysts and uh, really bright people and um, we try and you know contextualize where we currently sit and one of the charts we use is this build up anomaly uh, map. So build up uh, index, BUI, is uh, representative of the total amount of fuel on the landscape that's uh, readily available to burn. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm just gonna take a sip of water here. 
And so it's one thing to look at this chart on May 29th and see these orange colors and be like, oh my gosh, it's so dry. There's so much fuel that's available to burn. But what we like to do is look at the past 30 years worth of records for this date and look at the anomaly. So it's was like, well, is this particularly dry for this type of year? Or maybe it's always dry, you know? And so for, for, for example, if we look at the Kamloops Fire Center, which is uh, this polygon right here and the Southeast Fire Center, we're actually right where we should be at this time of year. It's not particularly dry, it's not particularly wet, it's just kind of average. Whereas the real anomalies are up and down the coastal fire center and up into the Chilcotin, what we call the Van Jam zone, and into the Nadina and the Balkley. And then not surprisingly, up where our biggest fires are burning, up in Fort Nelson, Fort St. John, and now Tumblr Ridge, uh, that's where we're observing the highest build up index anomaly. So again, these charts are helpful for, for us, for our, all of our managers, uh, our ministers to contextualize where we currently sit uh, compared to historical averages. Oh, sorry, didn't have a chime to play with my animations there. Um, you know, something else that's super helpful for us, and we just presented these photos yesterday uh, during our ministerial briefing and our seasonal outlook is, okay, we know where we've been. Where do we currently sit? How are fires on the landscape currently behaving? And we've got two great examples here. I'll start with the one on the left, which is our Donny Creek fire. This fire is now over uh, 300,000 hectares. It's one of our largest fires ever recorded in British Columbia. And as I mentioned, Fort St. John picked up 40 to 60 millimeters of rain uh, on May 22nd and 23rd, which is great. Everyone's like, oh, sweet. You know, it's going to knock down our fire behavior and then slow this thing down. The fire took a quick 36 hour break. And it, this was three days after, uh, we received that rain. So it was back to rank six, rank five fire intensity, just continuing to plow through that, uh, black spruce fuel type and getting reports from boots on the ground from you know, firefighters are out there. You know, I sit behind a desk all day and I try and figure out what's going on, but getting firsthand reports from, you know, fire behavior specialists and crews who are actually responding to these fires is, is gold to us, right? And we get photos sent uh, to us like this from air attack officers, and it just speaks to how vigorous the fires are burning. And it, it, it increases our confidence in our assessment that, yeah, I guess the drought really is, it's real. And, and the forests are, are reflective of that drought and the uh, observed fire intensity is uh, is matching what we'd expect. On the right-hand side there, uh, this is from Vancouver Island. Uh, this is the Newcastle Creek fire, just burning uh, inland from Sayward. So about two thirds of the way up Vancouver Island. You know, we're talking the coastal rainforest here. We have big giant old growth cedars, Western hemlocks, and typically a really moist environment. And keep in mind, this photo was taken just a few days ago on June 3rd. Um, so, you know, spring on the coast is usually pretty wet, pretty humid, and yet we're seeing consumption upwards of a meter down into our duff layer. Uh, you know, by reference, that Pulaski, that axe is a meter long. And so to see, you know, root bulbs and the deep organic layer being consumed in early June, has raised a lot of eyebrows uh, for you know a lot of our veterans, right? Who have 25, 30 years of, of fire experience under their belts. So being able to observe and report on, on current fire behavior, again, is, is really useful as we step forward, right? Because then we start to ask ourselves, okay, we know where we've been, we know where we currently sit. What do we need to either alleviate these intense fire conditions and, and persistent drought conditions, or what, what could possibly make it worse? So this is where we kind of shift gears and really in each of our seasonal outlooks, we probably spend, I would argue, two thirds of our time looking back and looking at current conditions before we even get into the, the forecast. And uh, we're really fortunate to, uh, again, have this large team within BC Wildfire Service. You know, I'm, I'm relatively new in the world of wildfire with only three years under my belt, but previously I was with Environment Canada for 18 years and I've, I've kept some really good ties there. And they have a fantastic team uh, right across Canada of what they call warning preparedness meteorologists. So these are people who are in charge of uh, liaising with various uh, agencies. So including, I'm sure we have a lot of wildfire representatives here from different agencies across Canada. Um, and 
they essentially have an open door policy. So I'll often pick up the phone or fire them an email and say, hey, Armel, Bobby, our, our WPMs here in British Columbia, what are you guys think? Like, you know, I'm, this is what I'm picking up on. Do you guys concur or can we have a, you know, uh, a constructive discussion about it? And then we'll compare notes and uh, they just got a tremendous amount of expertise in house. And uh, it's been uh, great throughout the summer. We, we check in on a weekly basis. And I like to say that we look at, we look at meteorology um, through a different lens, right? So their mandate is more about, you know, public forecasts and alerts and uh, public safety. Whereas us as fire weather forecasters, we're really attuned to relative humidity, um, to winds and obviously to lightning. So we're looking at weather just through different lenses and it's great to be able to compare and contrast and then help. Sometimes they they even help elevate our message. You know, uh, leading into this weekend, we had quite a bit of concern here with the winds coming in and uh, some more lightning on some very dry fuels. So they issued what they call a, a weather notification and it just helps get the word out to emergency managers and decision makers. So yeah, collaborating with uh, expert agencies, uh, if you don't have a tie-in to Environment Canada, I really encourage you to uh, to knock on their door. And they're really a great, passionate group of people and uh, been able to share a tremendous amount of uh, info with us. And then on the left is just like a, a screen capture of, you know, some of the staff I get to work with. You know, some of these people have 30, 35 years of fire experience under their belt. And so when I come to them with, you know, the most likely scenario, they're able to comment on, oh, yeah, that's probably not going to be too good. Or, yeah, don't worry about it. I've seen this before. Um, Environment Canada, uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada, uh, every season they host a, a, a seasonal outlook. Uh, it's not public facing, but if you're within the realm of, of fire, um, firefighting, fire weather, uh, emergency management, you can have access to these seasonal forecasts. So uh, for a long time, it was Marielle Allary. She recently retired. Uh, Jeff Miller is now taking the reins. And uh, it's awesome uh, every season. So they would have held it on June 1st for the summer outlook. They'll present their seasonal forecast. And so they do a tremendous amount of work and we just get to you know, benefit from all their work. So they'll present all the latest guidance, for example, from the, uh, the global ensemble prediction system, the JEPS uh, with, you know, starting with the monthly outlook. They'll break it down into week periods and speak about their confidence in different scenarios playing out. Uh, they'll go and compare with other international agencies. So in this case, the uh, NOAA CFS V2, um, the Euro model, the almighty Euro, Euro model, arguably the best model in the world. Uh, and so really, you know, there's endless opportunities and I'll show a couple in a couple slides here, but yeah, there's, there's so many resources out there. And what you're essentially looking for is the agreement between the various international weather agencies, right? And so when they're all singing the same tune, in this case, you know, all you see is a sea of red across Canada this summer. Well, confidence is quite high that we're in for a, a warm summer. Um, you know, they'll they'll touch on the evolution of the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Um, maybe I'll take a couple seconds just to myth bust. You know, there's been quite a bit of attention surrounding the building El Nino. And if you go digging into scientific literature, there's actually limited evidence that El Nino impacts our fire seasons in the summer. There is some, um, uh, particularly as we transition from La Nina to El Nino, what we call La Nada, or that neutral period that we're currently in. There is some evidence that shows increased probabilities of more active fire seasons, but that correlation coefficient is not super strong. So I feel like the whole El Nino story is getting quite a bit of attention when the correlation isn't isn't totally there. Um, you know, they'll briefly touch on the precipitation forecast, but uh, even Environment Canada will will be quick to admit that there's there's just not much skill there. And then, you know, we do what we call a, a poor man ensemble approach, right? So it's just looking at these individual deterministic or even ensemble models. Uh, I won't get quite into the difference between those two. I mean, deterministic, you're essentially looking at one individual output, you're essentially putting all your eggs in one basket. So perhaps you're looking at the Canadian global model or you're looking at the GFS model. Those are deterministic models. Whereas when you shift into the world of ensembles, you're looking at a collection of 20, 40, sometimes 50 models. So I think uh, one of my favorites is the NAFES, the North American Ensemble Forecast System. And uh, that's a collection of 42 models. And the benefit there is it's a bit of a statistical exercise. You, you purposely introduce uh, error in the initial conditions and you look at how those errors 
uh, evolve with time. Uh, each of the individual model members also have slight tweaks in their parameterization and their physical schemes. And so you send these 42 models out to the racetrack and then you see how they all finish. And when they finish in good agreement, that gives us confidence. And when they finish with a super large spread that diminishes our uncertainty, you can get into bimodal distributions and all that stuff. But yeah, um, go on for hours about ensembles, but essentially it's a good practice to shop around and just look at various international agencies. I've got the UK Met office here from Great Britain. Uh, International Research in Institute is uh, out of Columbia is a really great uh, resource as well. Uh, there's NOAA's Climate Prediction Center that issues uh, forecasts, and then there's the World Meteorological Organization, and you can see all the participating members there across the bottom. We've got Beijing European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting, the Euros, uh, UK Met, Environment Canada, of course. Uh, and the list goes on and on. So yeah, it's it's almost overwhelming how many how much guidance is out there. And ultimately at the end of the day, you got to come to your audience with a somewhat of a clear message. Um, but yeah, you can spend lots of time. To, I always say it's not a challenge to find resources. It's it's more of a challenge of how to consolidate all this information and and come forward with a clear message. So here's just an example of the outlook we issued just yesterday, hot off the press. So, you know, we we typically go with CANSIPS. It's 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 a well-proven model, particularly when it comes to temperature. And so uh, I'm sure you've all seen this by now, you know, the outlook for this summer. Again, we're just looking at probabilities here. People, again, look at this and are like, oh, it's going to be cooking hot. It's like, no, there's just really strong probabilities that we're, we'll see warmer than normal conditions. Uh, so that's June and, you know, we're already nine days through June and it's been really hot here in BC. So almost guaranteed this forecast is going to verify. As we get into July, you'll notice the signal fades uh, across the entirety of Canada. So now we're only talking 40 to 50%, 60% in some areas around the Great Lakes and uh, Hudson Bay there. But uh, the signal fades in July. So it's like, well, you know, confidence is a little less high in July, but keeping in mind that July in Canada is generally pretty warm anyways, right? And then as we get into uh, August, um, at least our signal here in British Columbia starts to increase as it does in Atlantic Canada. And ultimately you put these three months together and uh, this is what it looks like, right? So pretty fair confidence that uh, most of Canada will see a warmer than normal summer. And again, think back to that graph I showed you, you know, where you're averaging 90 days worth of weather. That doesn't mean we won't have a couple cold snaps um, I'm sure we'll get some rainy, cold weekends in here, but uh, overall, over that 90-day period, it will most likely be warmer than normal. And I've said that term quite a bit. Uh, I never define normal. So when we, we're talking about climate normals, it's a very specific definition. Um, it's actually a 30-year period at what we call climate reference stations. So the highest quality, the highest grade of climate monitoring systems most often owned and operated by Environment Canada. And climate normals come out in chunks of 30 year periods. And we just recently uh, have access to the latest 30 year period, which is 1991 to 2020. Prior to that, it was 1981 to, to 2010, right? So when we're talking about climate normals, that word normal means a 30 year fixed period. And so when we're looking at forecasted weather, we're comparing it to that 30 years worth of, worth of weather. Uh, in terms of precipitation, this is where I always go super fast in my presentations. I'm like, yeah, it looks drier in June. Look at that, no signal in all of July, classic, and no signal in all of August. And then uh, look at this bullet here. I should just put this flashing and in red, all caps. It's important to highlight the limited accuracy of long range precipitation forecast because it's not gonna get it right. Um, we then kind of remind people, you know, again, we. Uh, again, I, I talked about dangling the carrot, you know, it's like, oh, the BC Wildfire Service is going to issue their their seasonal outlook. And so we draw a lot of people in. But once you have this captive audience, there's an opportunity there to, number one, educate them on the limited accuracy of a seasonal forecast. But then, but here's what we can tell you, you know, and here's a great opportunity to remind people. It's like, hey, we're heading into lightning season. Our fuels are already snow free. They're already very receptive to ignitions by lightning. And on average, you know, we, we typically see an uptick in, uh, in lightning activity right across Canada uh, through June, July, and August. So, you know, we're anticipating more starts from lightning. 
Um, and then this chart's kind of handy from Environment Canada. Again, it shows you the average uh, start date to the lightning season. So you can see that in the Kootenays and up through the Caribous, uh, they start quite a bit earlier uh, in the season, whereas you know the piece is yet to come into lightning season. They're uh, more in, in July there for the Northern Rockies. And then uh, we thought it'd be really useful. This is relatively new and it seems to be landing quite well uh, with both the media and our stakeholders is just kind of painting these, these possible scenarios as we go forward. And so these charts are what we call 500 millibar charts. They represent the general circulation in the, the middle layers of the atmosphere. It's kind of like a go-to chart for talking about the big weather picture. Um, so on the left, you know, we've painted this dry scenario with this big blocking ridge of high pressure, and this is actually what's currently unfolding in British Columbia. We're just nearing the end of this current heat wave. Um, and again, looking at the seasonal predictions, it's looking like we'll have a higher frequency of these blocking ridges, right? It's probably going to be hotter than normal, and because it's hotter than normal, it'll probably be drier than normal. The two typically go hand in hand. Um, the scenario in the middle, you know, is what we call quote unquote normal, you know, we there's a semi-permanent high pressure system that sits off the coast of California and typically extends northwards in the summer. Um, that's why a lot of Vancouverites live in Vancouver. They deal with 10 months of rain, but they always get those two months of sunshine in, uh, in July and August. Uh, and, you know, because we've already talked about the antecedent conditions, because we've set the stage, we know that even should this normal scenario play out, it wouldn't bode well for a fire season. Our fuels are already so dry. Our drought is already so deep and persistent that even if we manage to pick up a few showers here and there, it's not gonna be able, enough to alleviate this, uh, this already very active fire season. And then the scenario on the right um, is what we call, you know, upper lows or, uh, or large scale upper troughs. And I would love to see one of these materialize. I mean, we, we have a, a brief one next week here moving into Western Canada. But, uh, you know, there have been Junes where uh, we call them Junuaries, where they're just cool, showery, unsettled. And that's what we had actually last year in 2022. Uh, it was very wet. It was very showery, very cool. And everyone was riding off the fire season. But we uh, we turned the corner in July and ended up having a, a prolonged fire season right into October. But, you know, this this third wet scenario, we're not seeing any indication right now of that happening. And we have always said in British Columbia that um, the uh, the intensity and you know the activity of the fire season greatly depends on June rainfall, and um, we kind of always say that message early in the spring because people start asking us like in March, oh, what's the fire season going to look like? And that's our classic response, like, well, we'll have to see how much rain we get in June. But here we are in June, and we're not getting much rain, so now we're kind of shifting focus to uh, scenario number one there. All right, um, just a couple more slides here and then we'll open it up to questions. Hopefully you're still awake. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's also handy to compare back to, to previous seasons. Uh, so in this case, we've chosen the drought code map. Uh, drought code, as most of you probably know, represents the moisture content in our deepest uh, duff layer, deepest organic layer, and uh, also the moisture content in our large woody fuels. And so, uh, if we look at the drought code map this year on June 1st, the big image here, we can see rather elevated drought codes uh, through Kamloops Fire Center, up through the Caribou, and around Prince George, and then of course the Peace Country, which is extremely dry right now. Um, and it's helpful to perhaps compare uh, with historical charts for that same June 1st period. And you know, some of our biggest fire seasons here in British Columbia have, were 2017 and 2018 and uh, 2021. Uh, or some of our biggest fire seasons in recent memory. And if we compare the number of hectares burnt, and then in this case, we're talking 1.2 million hectares for the entirety of the 2017 fire season, 1.3 million for the entirety of the 28 season, and uh, 870,000 hectares for 2021. As of June 1st, we've already burnt 351,000 hectares. Uh, and this is on June 1st. This is at 400,000 hectares right now, uh, just a week later. So we're not even into the peak of fire season yet, July and August, and we've already burnt, you know, more than 16 of our last 20 fire seasons worth of, uh, of forest. So we're rather confident that this will be uh, an active fire season to say the least. 
And then we just kind of wrap it up usually with some key points, you know, news you can use, like, what does this mean? You know, we, we've kind of set the stage and like, okay, it's been really dry and hot. We've got persistent deep drought. Uh, you know, our snow melted off earlier than normal this year. We're heading into lightning season. We're anticipating more ignitions from lightning. You know, stuff that's that's kind of logical, but you're connecting the dots for people. And then, you know, with our seasonal forecast we issued yesterday, we we painted a pretty grim picture. You know, and and again, there comes the fine line of of communicating uncertainty and and risk communication. It's like it's really from a probabilistic discussion, right? It's right now the table's set for what's likely to be a very active fire season. I am not going to say that the BC Wildfire Service is guaranteeing a record-breaking, you know, fire season because the media will just take that and run with it. Um, so for both our internal stakeholders, our staff, our colleagues, and our external partners, we're just kind of careful in how we we communicate these seasonal forecasts and then what people should be uh, gleaning from them. So I'll wrap it up there. Uh, hopefully that was interesting and uh, I'll pass it back to Karen and I think we'll open it up to questions. Thanks, Matt. That was actually, that was really great. Um, so much good information in there.